Welcome to, um, I guess this is episode three, I'm not sure, or if this is session three, I guess, for the Raz Reviews Movie Club. Um, this was actually a very exciting week for me because um, if you guys were here last week, I remember, um, you would remember that I haven't seen The Graduate. This, I've never seen it. I've seen bits and parts of it. I know the ending, I've seen the ending. Uh, I've seen it in film school, but I've actually never seen it. So. That was pretty cool. I really enjoyed um, watching a movie that I haven't seen, which is what some of the stuff that I was hoping uh, the movie club would do for people. You might end up watching a movie you haven't seen in a long time and you know appreciate it from a new, different point of view uh, a while back, or maybe even a movie that you know is really good or you know is very classic and popular, and then suddenly you somebody makes you watch it, you know, because you're not in school anymore, so we're not forced to do things that are good for us. Uh, but you know, this movie club is to motivate you to watch better films, quality movies, and then we come back and we discuss them, which is really nice. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna take a look at the comments and see who I have. Uh, the comments are are happening. So yes, it is here. Hi, yes, we missed you last week in our discussion of Children of Men. I hope you go back and watch it because it was actually a very interesting discussion. I actually liked my discussion uh, of uh, I liked our discussion of Children of Men more than I did Clockwork Orange. Interestingly enough, even though I'm more excited about Clockwork Orange, but still. Um, Neo is here, Ahmed Sulaiman is here, uh, Bimo, Raz is Chester, hey Chester, hi, Chester's joining us from the States, um, I think it's like 11 a.m. where you are, he's in Texas, so yeah, I've never met Chester in real life, he's an online friend, <laughs> from a, an extremely, extremely nerdy group of, of uh, online role, playing, uh, role players, so yeah, lots of anime fun stuff there, uh, Mustafa is here, whose nickname I never pronounce, <coughs> it's not Mustafa, it's Yusuf, Yusuf or Mustafa, I forgot. <coughs> oh my god, I'm coughing. No, no. <clears throat> I'm just... <clears throat> I'm okay. <clears throat> I'm not dying. Oh god. Alright. Um, so yeah, The Graduate. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, <clears throat> this was a very, very interesting movie for me. Because I've never seen it. I know that it's supposed to be incredible. And I know that it was very groundbreaking in the 60s. But... Um, oh, excuse me. But yeah... But <clears throat> I've never actually sat down and watched the whole thing from beginning to end. So I found that really, really fascinating. I found it a fascinating film. Um, I'm not a big fan of... <clears throat> I'm dying. <clears throat> I'm alive. I'm not actually a big fan of the script as much as I am of the directing and the cinematography. Um, I preferred the first half than the second half. But I appreciate the overall film and I really like some of the themes in it and some of the things that it raises. But mostly I was a big fan of its visual communication and how it was sort of painting a picture of a young man, a fresh graduate. And I mean, I'm not that old. It hasn't been that long ago when I was a fresh graduate and the whole world was in front of me. <clears throat> and the pressure on a young person to find their purpose and to find meaning, especially the pressure that comes from the older generation who are trying to push them to be better. So I thought that was pretty cool. And that's what we watched. So that was The Graduate. I want to hear your first impressions, guys. Uh, of the graduate uh, <clears throat> let me know have you seen it have you have you seen it before um, is it your first time uh, what were your general um, impressions of the film uh, Chester says don't die on us drink water I'm trying I just I don't know what happened I kind of <clears throat> have this thing stuck in my throat and it's not it's not going it's not going well anyway <clears throat> I'm alive I'm alive um, Yasser says, I agree with you on what you said exactly, on the portrait of youth and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an extremely, I found it strangely, even though it's very odd and very awkward and it's funny in a very weird way. And you know, back then, especially awkward humor was not something they were good at, but it's hit, it's there. And now awkward humor works more even than when it did back then. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really like the fact that it's, it felt very relatable. Um, it's a very interesting film, to be honest. I, very interesting choice. I was very happy that that's what we ended up with. Uh, let's take a look what we got. Um, Chester says, haha, you like the spicy affair more before the third point in the love triangle popped up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just about the, the, the love triangle. It's, it's more about, I really liked the first half because I really felt that it showed the pressure um, uh, on, on, on Ben on the, as a character and the pressure that young people get from older people who, who don't necessarily have fulfilled their life in a meaningful way and now they're sort of living vicariously through people who are younger and they're just constantly pressuring them and I felt that pressure and I related to it a lot 
and uh, even in his relationship with the older woman it, it wasn't more about like the spiciness of the relationship and the sexiness of it it was more about I really like the aspect of how young he is and how, um, um, you know, a fresh grad is supposed to be, oh, an adult. He's not an adult. Just because you just graduated doesn't mean you're an adult yet. You're still like a naive, innocent person. And I just like those aspects. The reason why I didn't, I wasn't a big, I didn't hate the second half. I wasn't a big uh, fan because I felt it dragged a little bit. Um, and I felt his obsession with Elaine and his obsession with meaning through Elaine uh, was a little far-fetched. So it, I wasn't buying it totally. It, feel, it felt a little silly. But I guess when you think about it, it's, you know, young people do stupid, silly things that don't re usually make sense. Um, so, yeah, so it's one of those things. Um, by the way, I have like, I keep looking there because I have live on Facebook because I'm trying to get Facebook people to come here <laughs> to the YouTube. Um, I have William there. William, what are you doing texting me on Facebook? Please come to the YouTube channel right there so others can see your messages and stuff. Says, I did disagree. Woody Allen was the king of awkward humor. Very popular. No, no, it's true. It's true. I'm just saying that it's not many, like mainstream didn't have. He's talking about me saying that um, awkward humor was not as rampant in the 60s and the 70s as it is now. It was there. Yes. And Woody Allen's definitely one of the big directors who, who, who really dabbled in awkward comedy. But it's just, it wasn't mainstream, you know? It wasn't as mainstream as it is now. Now most now you have Marvel movies that have awkward humor some sometimes. So it's just I, I find it find it very interesting how uh, timeless that element that aspect of it is. Uh, let's see. Wow, that's a lot of comments. That's that's more comments than, than I thought. Okay, um, we have uh, Neo saying it, no, it's not the first time I've watched it. Well, t but. What, what did you think about it? I saw it in university before I was a graduate and I didn't get it. <laughs> well, you weren't a graduate, so I, I, think, I think you have to be a graduate to get it, I guess, or at least graduating um, in that precipice of uh, sort of crossing the threshold of young to adult, you know? It's such a shock for everybody. I went to, I went to graduate school. <laughs> I did what Ben did, uh, but not because of the pressures of my parents, actually. I went, uh, uh, I went there because... I wanted to because I wanted to go to film school. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Chester says he saw it four years ago. Uh, is it Yusuf or Mustafa? NKA. NKA is the nickname. And you told me your name and I forgot. It's either Yusuf or Mustafa. I'm not sure. It was hilarious. I did not expect to laugh as much. Yeah, it's, it's actually very funny. Uh, I found it really, really funny. There were some really laugh out loud moments, especially like my favorite bits and the funniest bits for me is just. Uh, other than Ben's first night with, with Mrs. Robinson, which was hilarious, but actually his interactions with the people at the hotel were always, always funny. I really liked that. Um, Yasser, the one thing that is interesting about it is that at the birth of the, it was at the birth of the rebellious period. Uh, that's why it was groundbreaking. The movie is very much about how adults manipulate youth and how youth are done with it. I have a lot to say about censorship laws and how this movie tiptoed around the rules back in 67. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, agreed. Uh, uh, it, there is this movie definitely focuses a lot on the age gap, and uh, it's definitely present there. And I really like how uh, visual the movie is about it. It's not just showing us older people pressuring Ben. It's always very visual from the first sequence when he first comes home, and there's that welcome party for him, and he's in those like those frames, and he's constantly like uh, uh, he's constantly sort of pressured. Um, in the frame where it's cluttered and you see his face and like all of the other people are like in the foreground sort of like literally surrounding him in the shots and just asking him questions. What are you going to do? What about your future? I said, oh my God, I don't know. I just got home. I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was really nice visually. Um, and throughout the film, you always have like these shots of older people like looking at him, what he's doing and things like that. And I thought that was really, really effective. Um, so it was actually pretty cool. I, I really liked um, the framing of it. And it definitely does portray the age gap and how, uh, how, how, how wide it is, even though in society, it, like, technically, it's not, that, it's not that wide. We're not that far apart. But it's just mentally, um, especially back in the 60s, you know, there was this sort of, like Yasser is saying, cultural rebellion or revolution. Um, and sort of this um, refusal of the values and um, the, the societal restraints that were especially in the 50s, because I think the 50s was the height of, you know, 
society and uh, and rules and what people are supposed to do and gender roles and even like materialism and i think this is another thing that they comment on uh, as part of that uh, wave of thought of foregoing material things and that these things don't bring happiness or joy or purpose they make us empty and i felt the film really focused on that in a very nice way and it really did capture that uh emotion or essence back in that decade in the 60s where people were like your money means nothing your big mansions and houses and pools don't mean anything that's not what gives you meaning meaning comes from connections uh from spiritualism or from mental um evolution you know it's not from what society tells you you have to be rich and successful and have a car and have a house and this kind of stuff and i felt like the 60s what was a rebellion and the 70s was a rebellion against uh materialism and and uh, especially america and the west's obsession with materialism at the time in the 50s specifically you know the 50s the lavish dresses and the hats and you know and the, and, and and that and then they became you know all hippies uh, wow that's a a lot of comments okay um let's see um i lived this movie instead of daughters it was uh friends um that was the start of generation x the youth of rebellion yeah exactly uh let's see uh ever notice how he had no friends his own age at that damn party yeah i mean he's generally an isolated person and uh and yeah in the party i mean he's he can't make connection um the whole time we see him interacting with older people that he doesn't relate to um he doesn't feel like he uh is understood or embraced by these people and they're just pressuring him and that's i think sort of explains his obsession with Elaine because Elaine was finally an actual connection somebody he relates to on an emotional level that he connects with not physically or sexually or or even like his parents like he's connected to them through blood like this is a person who he formed a real emotional connection with and i think it gave him a sense of meaning and i think he became obsessed with that and yeah so the lack of it in the party or any of the previous scenes up until Elaine shows up um i think is very important and is there for a reason um let's see uh neo from a directing point of view this film is full of show don't tell which is fantastic um it's very rare these things are especially well done yes yes definitely um uh, 100% show don't tell this film is uh, extremely visual it uses um a lot of uh you would call it i don't know visual like poetic visuals um to really put you um in the situation and put you in um his shoes in Ben's shoes i mean uh, the most uh, famous uh, um example of that is the the water and the the fish bowl and the pool and the scuba diving and all of this i think these were like really beautiful visual motifs in the movie that i found again that's why i like the first half of the film those motifs were really engaging for me um <clears throat> from we're always seeing ben sort of surrounded by water uh, almost drowning in it um i mean like when you look at the fish bowl and specifically the scuba diver the plastic scuba diver there's there's so much like we can talk for an hour about this there's so much to talk about there for me uh uh i like the fact that again i think plastic represents um sort of materialistic consumerism um at its finest you know that's plastic things that we put on display just because they're cute like the scuba diver has absolutely no purpose but to be put on display however we want inside our fish tank which is purely decorative even though the things inside are alive we don't care you know <clears throat> and i think ben at certain points is that for his parents they don't really care about his happiness as much as they care about what he looks like in front of their friends you know purely decorative oh our son is going to graduate school ah show them what you can do in your scuba outfit show them show them you know and it's that kind of pressure of putting you know a human being on display and expecting things from him and also there's always these motifs of him drowning and being surrounded by water because of all the pressure he feels feels that he's faced by being a young person and having to uh worry about his future you know and that's the thing i'm just i'm just a little worried about my future you know and and i like there's especially like a very beautiful shot <clears throat> i found it really hilarious and and quite um um quite artistic when they physically put him in a scuba suit <laughs> in front of their friends literally putting him on display um inside an actual uh metaphorical 
um, fishbowl for his for their friends to watch him do something he doesn't even want to do. He doesn't want to be in the scuba outfit. He doesn't want to jump in the water. He doesn't do any of it. But he's forced, and I thought that was uh, really beautifully shown. And then I really liked the shot of when uh, you see his point of view and you see his parents pushing him inside the water, like, and he just keeps trying to come out. He doesn't want to be there, but they're physically pushing him under. Uh, uh, despite him wanting to come up for air. And I just, I, I thought that was actually really fantastic because, um, you know, it's it's pretty pretty apt for the feeling that he's having. And it was presented here in such a cool, interesting way, you know. And that's what I like about the film. That's why I say it's it's more the directing and, and the uh, the mise-en-scene, right? The, the framing and the, the elements that are on the screen that are telling the story, that are painting a picture or portrait of how this young man feels. I thought that was the best thing about the movie and I actually enjoyed it a lot. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, said, Raz Reviews. There's no music to motivate your emotions, which is amazing because the funniness, hurt, love, sadness, all driven by character, not by the filmmakers. I don't agree with you um, at all. Um, I mean, I know you're talking about score, but this movie has, um, I think, one of the best possibly one of the best soundtracks ever made, which was the album made for this film by Simon and Garfunkel. And that's what how I know The Graduate in the first place. So I know The Graduate from, because I'm a big Simon and Garfunkel fan and I love The, uh, uh, so, uh, the Sound of Silence and uh, Mrs. Robinson and uh, The Boxer and Are You Going to Scars at Obey or whatever. So I love those songs and it's actually beautiful. And they, they, the way, the reason why, and again, I've only heard the soundtrack before and I've seen bits of the film, but I was obsessed with the soundtrack when I was young. And even like uh, one of my cars, my first car was actually named Cecilia after a Simon Garfunkel song. So that's, a, that's another thing. But anyway, but like I've always connected with this music because I felt like it represents loneliness and emptiness and aimlessness in life, which is things I personally struggle with. And I've always connected with those songs. And then when I watch them being played here, representing that for the character, some, like it all clicked in my head, like, ah, you know, that's what um, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend is, you know, that song is about the feeling of emptiness and loneliness and just complete um, lack of, um, purpose yeah and how it feels for you when you are young and i thought it's just captured so beautifully in that music and whenever they're playing it in those montages i just i thought it was absolutely fantastic it gives you that feeling of in arabic we call it wahshi i don't know what you call it in english it's so it's like loneliness and emptiness combined into one feeling and i thought it was amazing um it was pretty cool let's see ah oh, so many comments um chester the physical connection is more with elaine's mommy is correct um Everybody hit the like button, William saying, thanks guys. Yeah, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. And actually, if you can, hit the uh, notification bell because um, otherwise uh, it's really tough to get through to anybody through the, um, the beautiful YouTube algorithm. It kind of blocks my videos, so it's tough because I, I'm posting from an Arabic country, but I'm not an Arabic language, so they don't know who I'm supposed to go out for. So it's a little thing. Uh, the fakeness of the plastic is a great metaphor, says Chester. Thank you. Um, uh, Yasser is saying that's really what Arab kids go through with parents and also back in my generation. <sighs> you know, here's the thing. Let's get personal. I'm going to try not, not get political, but let's get a little personal. I always have this, um, and I've said this to Neil a bunch of times, is I really, really feel like our society right now is very similar, or at least like just recently, is very similar to the 50s in the United States. Like a lot of the uh, societal... Um, expectations and constrictions, the way the government functions, I'm not going to get political, but especially how households, family units, uh, the, the focus on materialism and what people think of you and mazahir, which is basically what you look like to your community, uh, community values, religion, you know, this stuff, I feel like right now we are living it in our Arab world with our parents and our families. It really does feel very similar to the 50s. Um, in the United States. So I'm hoping the next phase is the 60s first, because 60s and 70s are amazing phases in, in, in the West. I'm hoping we get that. But I see what you're saying, you know. Definitely the moment you graduate here, you go home, you're gonna get that party. And people are like, so what now? What are you gonna do now? So you go to school and then like people just have these gatherings at home with uncles and aunts. And it's like, so what are you gonna do? 
What are you gonna do? And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go to college. Oh, what are you gonna study? I don't know. You don't know. You're a kid. You want to play video games? No, no, no. You're gonna. Which college are you going? Which country are you gonna? Of course, we have the whole immigration thing. And if you immigrate and go to another country, you're assumed to be a better young man and a more valuable. That's how they like kind of. Um, uh, uh, sort of value you, you know, they define your value by what you do next, what you're gonna do, not by what you've done, not what you achieved, but what else are you gonna do? So it's never enough. You, you, you finish high school, you graduate, some people don't graduate, nobody appreciates it, like, what's next? It's not enough. College, college, okay, what are you doing in college? Are you going to study psychology? Are you going to do art? No, doctor, engineer, you know? And then after that, you graduate, and then it's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to, you're going to get a master's? Are you going to get a PhD? Are you going to get a high-paying job? I'm 21. How am I going to get a high-paying job? Oh, you have to work hard. You have to, la, 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 you know? I felt it so much now in 2020, the stuff that's there that's happening that they are talking about in the film. It really does feel like the 50s. And then after you get your job and after you get your education, are you going to get married? Who? Where? How? When are you going to get married? And then you get married. Oh, when are you going to get kids? You get kids. When are your kids going to school? When are your kids going to graduate? When are your kids are going to college? It's never ending. It's never ending pool that you're constantly drowning and you can never come up for air. So I really, really connected with those elements. This is why, again, the first half is just absolutely fantastic for me. Um, there's a lot of comments, so I'm sorry if I can't get through um, all of them. Um, so yeah, let's see. Um, Ahmed Suleiman saying, yeah, we are still obsessed with the nuclear family model, correct? Which was which the West has sort of abandoned a long time ago. Well, not all the West, but yeah, generally, sure. Uh, I wish I, uh, Neo saying, I wish I had an affair instead of this lame degree. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sort of saying, and your dreams are, are garbage. Um, 632, I don't know what 632 is. Uh, it's like Fight Club. Mm, how? You draw, you drew connections to Fight Club. Interesting. I sort of drew a connection like to modern, to uh, uh, newer films. I drew a connection to uh, uh, 500 Days of Summer. It reminded me of that. It's the concept of happiness through love that it's sort of a facade. Like I, that's, I, I thought of 500 Days of Summer when I was saying that. Uh, Chester says it's hard for adults to measure success for a kid because comparatively they did so much more when they were your age. I mean, yeah, I mean, arguably, but more back then is not what it is now. You know, there is the concept of, uh, you know, inflation, but not for money, for achievements, you know. Now it's an achievement for you to have a house on your own and pay for it. You know, back in the day, everything things were different and having a house was something very easy now like you most most adults live with their parents it's it's nuts you know so it's not the same so the 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 measurement they use is kind of interesting um so yeah um more comments you guys are talking a lot which is very interesting i didn't think uh how many people do we have on this stream i mean it's not a lot of people today it's like nine people but you guys are talking a lot which uh, it's fine keeps me company um so yeah, another thing I wanted to talk about other than the age gap and the visual communication, I also like some of the cinematography is actually beautiful as we spoke. Um, I really liked how uh, the framing was done, uh, which is more directing, but I also thought that the use of light and shadow was very, very interesting in the movie. Um, I really liked how uh, Ben, uh, a lot of times he's aware, he's aware that what he's doing is wrong. And a lot of times we find him framed um, in, in the shadow, right? like it really puts on display uh, even though like the lighting doesn't seem realistic and doesn't seem diegetic but it's somehow on display because he knows that what he's doing is wrong he's aware of the choices that he's making and that it's a mistake but you know that's what young people do they make the mistakes anyway but they are aware of it and i just thought that uh the way that he was framed through the lighting was actually very very interesting um especially in those scenes with mrs robinson in in the hotel room i thought that they used the shadow on his face in a very interesting way and i i, I really liked it again this film was very visually uh compelling um let's talk a little bit about the relationship right let's talk a little bit i mean neo wishes he has apparently a mrs robinson on his own which by the way neo this means you need uh, you need help buddy because this is not a healthy thing to want uh that's the point <laughs> i'm worried that you've missed it uh but anyway <laughs> um so yeah so basically um i really think that the that the film um introduces mrs robinson um, as so many things, she's, she's rep she represents a lot of stuff that we can discuss for forever. Um, Yasser says the lighting was not, especially when they converse in the dark for a while, yeah. 
Uh, William, fast forward to 1992, William is living with his parents, <laughs> uh, playing Nintendo and reading comic books. Every generation has their own uh, pace. Yeah, it's true. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I want to start the discussion about uh, Mrs. Robinson there. So uh, I think, I mean, Mrs. Robinson is, is, is sort of the ultimate, um, I think for him, uh, the ultimate... It's, she's not she's not a spiritual guide per se because she's I mean she's a horrible person right but is she I mean she's somebody who has wasted her life um, they mention how she had dreams um, um, that she had given up on and we know like little by little the information is, is fed to us that um, she married her husband because she got pregnant again a young person making a mistake and ruining the rest of their lives which is something that most young people don't even consider. They're not afraid of it. That's why we take chances and we take risks because we haven't fallen in those giant pit holes. And then some of us do and they end up like Mrs. Robinson. And I felt like she felt like somebody who was who has already, you know, sort of passed her prime and now she's in a relationship with this young man and she's just manipulating him and, and using him. And we know that. But again, the movie is all the way from the perspective um, of young Ben. And uh, I just... I really like, she's very manipulative and I think it's done really well and like it's an amazing performance for the two of them. It's such a horrible relationship to watch. It's, I mean, I don't know if it's for some of you felt uh, like, ooh, you know, maybe to Neo was like, ooh, I don't know, you're kind of messed up, man. For me, it was very disturbed, you know, it's a very toxic relationship and I, I really like the fact that uh, like one of the nice touches is that um, Ben uh, starts smoking, picks up smoking when he's in a relationship with her and that's because... Um, he, uh, it's toxic, you know, even though like he makes a point that he went through all of college um, without ever smoking and it's hinted that he's also a virgin uh, and then she comes in and just, you know, completely like poisons him. Uh, Chester says, Mrs. Robinson was cougar before cougar was a word. <laughs> you guys, this is really messed up. Um, Mrs. Robinson represents the outward success, meaning what society perceives on the inside, miserable and trapped. Yes, correct. And it's not just on the inside is trapped. I agree with you, William. Yes, on the outside. Again, it's, it's society's obsession with materialism and just this facade, right? They're obsessed with the facade rather than fixing what's on the inside. It's that wall up front. Look at how beautiful our wall is. And behind our wall, we are a mess. And what, what it is, is I think is that he, he, it's sort of describing society like this big shell, right? And the outer shell is so beautiful and, and, and rich and money and success and whatever you want, beauty. But on the inside, it's empty. And I think, again, I think that the, 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 the theme or the, the feeling of emptiness is rampant throughout the film. I mean, uh, uh, Mrs. Robinson is empty, right? She has, she's, the film is full of empty relationships, right? Like her relationship with Ben is purely empty. There is no affection there. There's no connection. It's just sexual and and devious and 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 it's just using him and even for him he's he, he doesn't he tries to connect with her but there's nothing to connect with um ben's relationship with his father is empty uh, with his parents it's just a he's again just something for them to put on display um her relationship with her husband is empty she's only with him because she was pregnant and that's what you're supposed to do in a society if you're pregnant you get married doesn't matter where your future is or what you want so i think that's what you what you're talking about is definitely yeah she is that you know, on the outside, she looks beautiful and well put together. But on the inside, she's an alcoholic. She's, she's empty, right? She's trying to fill that void. That's why she's in a relationship with him. Ben serves as an escape, William continues, uh, a way to capture youth. Yeah, yeah. Or, or to maybe try to fill that emptiness inside to back to a time where she didn't feel empty when she was young. Uh, Yasser says, in the beginning, I felt sorry for them both. And then it got disturbing just before Elaine shows up. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, Neo says he's just a tool for her it's funny because when he wanted to talk to her she's thinking man I really don't want to talk to this kid because she has nothing to say because she's empty inside what he's looking is he's trying to find meaning in their relationship because it's not enough for him because he's young it's not enough for him to, to, to have something so meaningless right and again he is the person who is looking for meaning in a world where everybody is empty on the inside and his relationship with everybody is empty as well because it's it's fake it's a shell so he's trying to find that with her and it's sort of um, um, uh, predates his his connection with Elaine and it sort of explains why he was so obsessed with Elaine because he found in her what he was looking in her in, in her mother for and did not find I think uh, Ahmad says I bet this movie sparked a wave of older women fetish when it came 
guys, you're killing me. I love how you're like completely missing like the toxicity of the relationship and you're like, oh, it's so nice. It's not, it's bad. Uh, Chester says, even if it did, nobody would have admitted it too bad. Pornhub statistics didn't exist back then. All right, thank you for ruining my ability to uh, uh, monetize this video, Chester. <laughs> we have all these bad words, you know, the yeah, keywords you get, and then la- the algorithm doesn't allow you to monetize, and then I have to explain. So thanks for that. That's that's more work for me when I post this video. <laughs> um, yeah, sir. It was also taboo at the time to show a woman as a sexual predator, yeah, and still needs and also having affairs, which is a mantle meant for men only. That's true till now, by the way. Till now, we still have this problem with how women are portrayed as, as weaklings, you know, as, as, as people who are supposed to be, um, who don't have any desires, you know, and things like that. Yeah, we don't, we, I mean, it's so much better now, but I think it could be, um, it could still be a, an issue. William is saying bad according to who? Uh, bad according to psychology. <laughs> I mean, look, if their relationship, I mean, this is, there is another film uh, that displays a relationship between a young man and an older woman, um, but that relationship is based on an actual connection, an emotional and mental connection between two people who are, the, the age difference is just insane. And that's another movie that was controversial. Came out the, around the same time, I'm not sure what year. That's Harold and Maude. If you guys have ever heard of Harold and Maude, it's an extremely, uh, like, it's not this. <laughs> it's not a comedy. It's a drama. And it's, it's a relationship between a teenage boy, I think he's in school, with a really old woman. Like, not a cougar, not Mrs. Ra- like, an, like, as old as his grandma. But somehow they, they fall in love. And it's a whole thing. It's, it's a very interesting film to check out. But... It's a film that makes the argument is that is their relationship bad? In this sense and in this context, I think according to the filmmaker, at least from what we've seen visually, I think he portrays it as something bad, as something uh, that's toxic. It's not a healthy relationship that has any meaning. It's empty. Um, So yeah. Um, So that's the point about their... uh, Uh, the empty relationships around them that I thought were very, very powerful. Um, What else can we talk about in this film? Let's talk a little bit about Elaine. We haven't really talked about it a lot. Um, Okay, Chester, can we talk about how much black character Elaine was? (laughs) I have a friend named Elaine who hates this film in principle because Elaine was a whole lot of nothing. (laughs) Okay, well, I don't know. Do we... Is Elaine nothing? I mean... I think that Elaine's character and um, her presence in the film is is a lot more than what meets the eye. Um, I think, um, can you argue that she's nothing? She's 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 not really. It's not about who she is. It's about what she represents to him, which is the thing that he's you know searching for, which is an emotional connection and a meaning. And again, just to show how much young people. Uh, and, and the different it's the age gap and how much difference between young people and the people from the older generation the moment you put old people together they get it they get what they're talking about just like put a bunch of 30 year olds now together and just drop a subject and you'll find that they really agree and they connect and it's hard to find a real connection between uh, uh, the different ages in society because of that age gap because of, of the expectations and the restrictions um, and maybe the lack of open minded mindedness in an older generation And I think his relationship with her is not healthy either. Um, It's also sort of obsessive, right? And it's because throughout the whole first act of the film, we see him struggle um, with having meaning, right? His life seems a little bit meaningless and he doesn't really, um, he can't find purpose. He doesn't know what to do and he's worried about his future, right? And then comes Elaine and Elaine represents the opposite of that for him. Elaine gives him uh the 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 some form of emotional connection or meaning and i think the moment he gets that he knows what he's craving for and he becomes obsessed with her because that's what she represents to him that doesn't mean that their relationship is healthy or that they're good for each other it's just that they connected and it's the first time he's connected with anything and i think uh, it sort of also is a toxic relationship an unhealthy connection that he has with her and it leads into an unhealthy relationship and uh that leads us to talk to uh talk about um the ending right so the ending of the film which um there's a lot of debates about the ending and what it means um we'll get back uh to it uh let me see what you guys are saying uh william says uh yasser says first uh i had trouble buying his interest in her at the beginning i felt very 
Uh, it felt very physical at first. Later on, she made more sense to me at the end when they are at the church and the bus together, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you see that connection there. And also you see her, her, the influence on her. I mean, you know, I think it's just representing young love and how irrational and crazy it makes you. And this is a perfect, like, he, he, he acts irrational, you know, he, he goes nuts. And then later on, um, he causes her uh, to act irrational and she goes nuts and she screams really weirdly in the church. And it's just this effect like young love has on you where you lose your senses, you lose your rationale and you just act crazy. And I love the fact that the two of them get on a bus when they do the most immature thing possible, which is just walk out on a wedding <laughs> and walk out on their family and walk out on their responsibilities and choose youth and irresponsibleness or or, or, or I don't know, open-mindedness or whatever. And I love that they get on a yellow bus like their kids, you know, like getting on a school bus. And I love that the bus was filled with older people judging them and looking at them and just again showing you that big generation gap between the two of them. Um, William says she represents mystery and adventure that people look for in youth. That mystery and adventure is self-determination, is how youth find meaning. Correct? Yeah, that's that's what I what I'm talking about when I'm talking about meaning and his obsession with with he finds meaning with her. That doesn't mean that they're they're good together. It's just she represents that for him and uh, and he becomes obsessed with it for sure. Uh, Yasser says the fading smile at the end was great. Shows what now? Now that rebellion is done, we, we gotta we're gonna talk about that. The relationship may have not ended with a happily ever after. You need to try and fail on the path to finding purpose. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot can argue that they're, they, they've only really been on one date together, like one real date. And after that, it's just obsession and stalking and then just runaway marriage. So it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, and it's clearly like a mistake. And, you know, you might even think of it as... as as a cycle, right? That, that you know, this is what happened to Elaine's mom, right? To Mrs. Robinson. She married young and definitely, clearly, she regrets it because the relationship was not meant to be. She was not meant to marry this person. Yet she married him at a young age, gave up on her hopes and dreams and later grew to resent him and become an empty, horrible person. And now the two of them are doing the same mistake. And some might argue, was, was Mrs. Robinson trying to save her daughter from this? Maybe she was trying to not get her to marry young. But then again, they, she did force her to marry the other guy young. So maybe she's also trying to perpetuate, um, maybe she's trying to turn her into herself, like put her in a, in a marriage where she marries very young. She's forced, clearly not somebody she's meant to be with. And maybe later she can grow up to be like her. Maybe she's jealous of her daughter. I mean, there's a lot of psychology here to discuss. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, Chester says, oh yeah, the end was shaping up to make Elaine out exactly like her mom. Ah, that's what I was just saying. Exactly like her mother, rushing into a think, and then they realize too soon they're going to be trapped as Mrs. Robinson. Yeah, true, true, yeah. I mean, again, that, that final scene, uh, a, a, lot of con a lot of, not controversy, but a lot of discussion and a lot of different opinions, analysis of, of, of them. Because they first jump into the bus, they're very happy, they're smiling, and then the camera lingers on them for a while. And again, it's that framing, man. I love the framing in this film and the mise-en-scene. I love how they're separated. You can see already they are separated um, in those windows behind them. Both are boxed away from each other. They're not one. They're not connected. Not really. And I think they're both realizing like, oh my God, what did we just do? You know, and it's again, it's that feeling of youth looking towards the future. He's worried about his future. And whenever you look at it, it's that sense of anxiety and, 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 and emptiness. And I think the ending sequence is that. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a happy ending. And it's very easy to misread that and become somebody who's obsessed with love and relationships. And I think it talks about that as well. Because when we're young, we're really obsessed with love. And we're obsessed with the relationships. We're obsessed with our uh, boyfriends and girlfriends or what have you. Like, we're crazy. And we, we drive everybody crazy. And I mean, imagine yourselves when you were young and you were in love and how irrational we were and how obsessed, obsessed, obsessed. You can't sleep, you can't eat, you're on your phone or whatever. You know, and then when you grow older, you realize, you know, and people come and go, <laughs> you know, and you grow more cynical and you grow less attached. And, and I think um, that that whole sequence and that whole him obsessing over her irrationally and illogically is sort of like uh, the, 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 the very, very adequate sort of re representation of that. Uh, yes, sir. Even Miss, Miss, uh, Mr. Robinson had regrets. He advises him to sow his wild oats. It's true. Yeah, because he married young, because he got, he got a girl knocked up. 
uh, and not to jump into responsibility right away, maybe out of regret. Absolutely. All these people around him, all these older people, again, talking about how the film makes a commentary on the generation gap and why it is still so timeless. I think that's really cool. This is one of the timeless things about it. Like I watched it now in 2020 and I still relate to those themes and I still relate to that generation gap. Granted that I come from a cultural society that's still stuck in the 50s, but <laughs> I still relate to, you know, I still, even in modern day, I still relate to that um, where these older people have their regrets and have their expectations um, and they're trying to force on their young children and to live vicariously through them which is toxic and an unhealthy uh, relationship definitely um, <clears throat> uh, um, he was bored and then passionate and Kia says he was bored then passionate and then back to boredom I mean it's not boredom as much as it's um, what's the word uh, dread i would say he's not as much bored as he is dreadful and and uncomfortable he's anxious you know he doesn't know what to do he wants an answer but he doesn't have one and he feels empty because he has no direction because the moment you leave school you're out of direction when you're in school you know you know fifth grade sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade nine twelve graduate college year one year two year three and then when you graduate the what are you gonna do there's no real road ahead you know you, you, the, the, he doesn't know where this bus is going <laughs> and that's a really daunting feeling uh for a young man um yeah so it says framing is a big visual theme in the film yeah absolutely um how did you feel about the dialogue i mean the dialogue um bits of it are a little bit outdated but i think uh, most of it is 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 very it, it was utilized utilized mostly for comedy i think and a lot of those a lot of it actually was pretty funny um i don't really have i didn't feel anything more than that about the dialogue let me know if you felt something about the dialogue that stands out to you um chester says if it was my parents they would have told me to at least get a job yeah yeah they want him to go to graduate school yeah uh william this is also funny remember marriage is also one of the society's material yeah mark of success i was talking about that for us arabs if you're not married you are a giant loser even if you are a nobel uh like prize winner you're not married what's wrong with you right definitely it's part of that materialistic uh, outer shell on display for everybody it's that uh scuba diver inside the fish tank uh, in our rush to not being like previous generations we end up more like them yeah it's true it's true that's a good point. Uh, Neo, I'd love, love to imagine Elaine never using their affair against him. That the line. <laughs> oh, yeah, we well, used slept with my mother. Yeah, I think that's an argument ender right there. Uh, there is no escape from that argument at all. Yeah, I think for 50 years, that's going to be the end to every single argument they ever have, for sure. That's hilarious. Um. Um, in Kia, let's see. Yeah, chasing Elaine is used as a way to get direction. It's true. It's the first time he does actually have direction and he latches onto it like crazy and wouldn't let it go no matter what. That's why he just decided to marry her. Yeah, he's just, again, like he just, mm, just wanted any kind of direction because before that he felt very lost. William, the finding of purpose is actually for the individual. In this story, we see people trying to find purpose externally. Yeah. Other people are not responsible for your, your happiness. You are. Yeah, that's a good point. Again, yeah, this movie has a lot of, a lot of messages like that, I think. Um, and I think that's why it was such a popular film at the time. And uh, why it made such an impact on that generation, I think. I mean, people at the time were obsessed with it. Um, and I think it's because it resonated with them and spoke to them on a very, very deep level. Um, and I think the messages from it are actually quite positive. Um, Enike, the dialogue was extremely clever when at the beginning of their bedroom dialogue Mrs. Robinson says she knows nothing of art and then later on she says she studied art callbacks yeah yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of hints and information and a lot of exposition there in their talks a lot of things are revealed about their characters through the way they talk and what they say can we talk yes yeah, can we talk about the elephant in the room in our culture the very thought of a guy sleeping with his future mother-in-law is horrifying yuck well I mean, we have been talking about it clearly, like a lot of people in the comment section are like, yay. <laughs> so I don't know. William says bad according to who? So that's, uh, that's something to um, consider. I want to talk a little bit before I go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the film itself and uh, 
and how successful it actually was. So the movie was um, released back in December 1967 and it was very positively reviewed. It was actually pretty well reviewed um, and uh, it actually grossed a lot of money uh, for back then. Um, I think it, I think like the film grossed around, if you adjust for inflation, it almost reached a billion. If you adjust for inflation, it grossed around like $800 million. That means it's like in the top 50 or top 30 uh, highest grossing films ever in, in, in North America. Um, it was nominated for a bunch of uh, Academy Awards. I believe it was nominated for cinematography, directing and stuff. Uh, it won for directing um, uh, for the director, Mike Nichols, very much well deserved. And, um, and it's definitely on AFI's uh, 100 years list. That's why it's on our list. And um, it's, just a, it's just a very beautiful film. Um, Yasser was talking about how it got around censorship, and it did. There are like quick flashes of things you're not supposed to show back then, just like Alfred Hitchcock tried to get around censorship as well. Um, yeah, I, 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 I really like it. There's one of the funny things that I know about the movie is that uh, when they were rehearsing um, the, the first night between Dustin Hoffman and uh, Anne Bancroft, and Mrs. Robinson, oops, I just hit the laptop, sorry. Um, she did not know that Hoffman was going to like do, grab her. <laughs> I love that moment. It's really funny. Um, and he decided to do it. Hoffman sort of improvised that um, because it reminded him of schoolboys trying to like grab girls and stuff. And uh, when he did it, like Mike Nichols laughed, cracked in the middle of that. And they all started laughing and they had and just like instead of stopping the scene, they sort of like... Uh, uh, they, they all walked out and that's why you see um, Dustin Hoffman in the back sort of hitting his head on the on the wall because he's trying to stop laughing because Mike Nichols didn't cut he just walked away because he was laughing on set and that's a story I know from the set that's actually pretty cool uh, didn't even know he was going to fall for the daughter. Yeah, thinking about it at the time. No, I mean, the moment they said, you have to meet Elaine, you have to meet Elaine, I felt like, yeah, that's gonna happen. The moment she said, don't ask my daughter out, I'm like, yep, that's what's gonna happen. He's gonna, he's gonna take it. Uh, Chester says, wow, the hippies really drank it up. Yeah, I mean, it, it is rebellious. And at the time there was this uh, rev like thought, thought revolution, you know, societal revolution for them, a social revolution against the older generation. Um, it's their version of, okay, boomer. <laughs> You know, a very older version of OK Boomer of, you know, but but these people believe is so valuable, like money and family and uh, material is 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 bull, you know, and they 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 really enjoyed calling them out on that. The youth of that generation, the 60s and the 70s, that's a big rebellion that happened then. Um, and I think this movie reflects that mindset so well. And, you know, it's hard to tell. Sometimes you ask, does does life imitate art or does art imitate life? I don't know. Um, was that generation influenced so heavily by the graduate that they ended up being that kind of rebellious? Um, uh, uh, they, they became so rebellious against the older generation and all the rules that they had and the societal expectations kind of got thrown out the window. Was it the graduate that affected people so much or was it the time that affected the graduate to represent that time period and its and its way of thinking it's just it's an interesting thing to think about is it considered a comedy neo asks it it's quite dramatic it's a it's a dramedy it is definitely a sort of a comedy it's not a full-on whoa I, my phone fell <laughs> i'm really scared <laughs> i have my phone here with... <laughs> oh my god Sorry, Facebook people. I have my phone on for Facebook people so that maybe they'll come and join here. Uh, clearly, it's not really working. <laughs> and it, the only thing it did is scared me because it suddenly fell. Um, what were we talking about? We were talking about ah, yeah, is it a comedy or is it a is it a comedy or is it a is it a, it's a dramedy? Yeah, so it's definitely uh, meant to be a bit of a comedy. Whew, I'm so scared. <laughs> That was really, really scary. What other trivia can you give us about the film? Well, again, this is not a movie that I know much about uh, because I don't really know. Uh, I haven't seen it before. I've only seen parts of it in. Uh, I've only seen parts of it in 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 film school and things like that. I actually don't know much about it. All I know is that. Um, it's 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 one of the most popular films of all time, and I'm such a big fan of the of of the soundtrack. And again, like I know all the emotional beats of the film before watching it because I'm so I was obsessed with Simon and Garfunkel, and I was obsessed. Um, 
I was obsessed with it. Um, I, I think the most iconic thing about the movie is that shot. I mean, like when, when somebody says The Graduate, I just know the that promotional uh, still of the film where uh, you see Dustin Hoffman in the background and uh, he's framed by Mrs. Robinson's leg. And uh, that was like, that's one of the most iconic like shots in cinema and images. And by the way, that actually, that photo is not, uh, is not her leg. It's not the actress's leg. It's not Anne uh, Bancroft's leg. It's... Uh, it was. Uh, it belonged to a model. Um, I forgot her name. I think her name was something Gray. Um, she she's like she was a famous model at the time, and it's actually her leg in that photo in the, in the poster. Uh, and uh, she was played. This person later on actually played um, Mrs. Robinson in like a in in a in a, in a stage uh, musical of The Graduate in London. Um, but yeah, so that's actually not her leg. I know that. Um, and I like I know that the actress and Bancroft definitely was the the sort of the the fantasy of all young men back then. Uh, she was like their first like uh, uh, the, the first woman they had sexual fantasies about. It was like a very like big thing that happened. Um, and yeah, it was one of those films that won an Oscar. Like I said, I won, it won an Oscar for directing. It didn't win an Oscar for uh, any other category, which was, it's highly unusual, by the way. Usually, Oscars, the films that win an Oscar for directing, usually win something else. Um, it's uh, it's it's very unusual for that. That's really all I know about the film. I don't know much about the making of the film. Um, uh, if you guys have any, if you guys have any. Uh, trivia or anything you can share with me, please let me know. Again, because I haven't seen the film, so I haven't really... I don't know much about it. Uh, Chester says, uh, that lo- leg shot so iconic it showed up in Freakazoid, the children's cartoon. <laughs> Quite inappropriate, I would say. Yeah, I love the soundtrack. It's just, it's such a beautiful... And again, I really like the whole dark, like the, the Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. And it's very interesting when you think about the film because I made, I never I never made the connection I don't know but then when I every time I saw him like go to see Mrs. Robinson and turn off the light and go into the darkness um, it just reminded me of the lyrics of that song Hello Darkness My Old Friend and it's there visually which I thought was pretty cool um, I know the film is referenced a lot in pop culture yes Mrs. Robinson yeah the the line are you trying to sub- seduce me Mrs. Robinson are you trying to seduce me is a lot is a is is a is a line of dialogue that was referenced in a lot of movies it's very iconic um, it's used in a George Michael song. Yes, sir. Child of the 80s is here to tell us. Um, looking at Letterbox, the Anne Bancroft showed up in a lot of comedies later in her career, says Chester. Yeah, I guess she did. I mean, this launched the career of Dustin Hoffman. I mean, that's, I think, the biggest deal. He was very young at the time. And Dustin Hoffman was, I believe, I could be wrong, by the way, please fact check me. But I believe Dustin Hoffman, before this film, was a theater actor. He wasn't in films. And I think this was his big break. And I think Mike Nichols picked him because he was so awkward on camera. And that's why he was so awkward in this film, because he doesn't know how to be on camera. He's used to being on a stage. He's not used to cut action and things like that. And even Mike Nichols, oh, this I know. Oh, this I know. Uh, Mike Nichols, before this, was actually not a film director. He's a Broadway director, interestingly enough, which is why I was I, I was very shocked when I knew that because, or like when I watched the film, I was surprised because I imagined this movie to look more like a play. I imagined really big, long uh, shots that look like staging with a lot of like uh, blocking of actors walking around because that's usually how when directors become uh, film directors, they first start with these like big wides and long takes and uh, long takes and staging the actors. But actually, he went the complete other way. Um, he went from theater you know 2d into really like mise-en-scene and deep um, 3d blocking and cinematography and visuals so I thought that was really interesting did this movie start the rom-com trend of crashing weddings I don't know did it I don't think so I think we've seen some movie crashing in uh, no like uh, I know that Buster Keaton's film um, Sort of has some wedding crashing. Buster Keaton's film, what was it called? Oh my God, my cinema trivia is destroyed. This is why I'm doing this. Um, the one where he's, he has to marry somebody before a deadline in order to get an inheritance. 20, uh, no, something dresses. Oh, I don't remember the name of it. It's a Buster Keaton film. It's black and white, uh, a silent film. No, there, there's definitely been. I don't know. I'm going to go check it out. I don't know. You've made me very curious. Um, Neo says, what do you mean back then? Uh, what are you talking about? I don't know. There's a there's a delay between us, so I get the comments. You guys get my video a little bit late, so I get your comments late, so it's, it's a little bit um, 
confusing sometimes. Mark Nichols adapted a lot of Neil Simon plays later on. Oh, that's good to know. And you can see the Neil Simon influence in the movie dialogue. Yeah, cool. The movie felt like a stage performance in the beginning. It felt so uh, deliberate. Makes sense. Very theatrical. Yeah, it is. It is pretty theatrical, especially in those, especially the the the, the extras and the old people at the party and stuff. It really does feel like a play, uh, and it's 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 done very theatrically as well. Um, so yeah, I mean. That's The Graduate. Um, guys, it's uh, almost nine, so this has been a really interesting discussion. Not a lot of people today, but um, really, really good discussion. I actually really enjoyed it, but I think it's time for, you know what, it's time for us to um, pick our next movie. We have three minutes left. So um, let's pick the next movie out of our hat. Here's my Urahara hat, ready for our uh, movie picking. I have no idea what we are going to get, but I am uh, very, very excited. I hope you guys are excited Two, let's um, check it out. Ready? All right, here we go. Okay. What are we gonna watch? Oh, that's so interesting. Oh, uh, you guys see it? Amazing! Oh my god, that's actually pretty cool. The, fir the first one. None of the horrible sequels. Interesting. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Jurassic Park. Awesome. I am actually very excited. I've seen Jurassic Park a million times, uh, but it's been a very long time since I've actually seen the first one. Actually, it hasn't been there for a long time. I saw it. I saw it here in Dubai, where they did a, um, a showing where they played the orchestra live with the film, and it was actually an incredible experience. Um, but yeah, but actually, I mean, watching the movie is not what's exciting. Discussing it is actually going to be exciting because I think that this movie's script is extremely underrated. Um, it's better than people think it is. And I think it gets a bad rep because of all the campy sequels that came afterwards where it just became a, you know, a monster movie sort of thing. But actually the first film is very deep and very beautiful and extremely cinematic. Steven Spielberg. Um, this is going to be a cool discussion. Huh. Okay, 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 okay. It's going to be an interesting discussion. I actually have some really cool things, uh, some really cool insights on this film that I'm actually excited to share with you guys. So that's going to be um, our next movie. Um, so check in with the events, uh, with the events page to know when, in, when is our next, um, uh, our next uh, session, probably sometime next week. And also, by the way, I'm thinking of creating a, a group, like a Facebook group, so that we all can be there. I think it's better to communicate there because I can't reach all of you guys on Facebook. Facebook blocks most of my posts. I don't know who's on my page and who's on my YouTube. It's kind of a mess. So I think I'm going to do a, 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 a um, um, I'm gonna do a group on Facebook. I'll send invites and please invite others. I'll make it public and let's get more people onto these discussions. I think discussing Jurassic Park, some of our childhoods, us 90s kids, I think this is a really nice film to look back on and see just how good of a film it actually is. So cool. And it's a good uh, mood shift because we've been doing a lot of, uh, um, Oh, yes, they're saying what a mood shift from apocalyptic and you know dystopian to 60s rebellion, now to action and special effects and science fiction and philosophy actually there's a lot of philosophy in this film that i really really like okay um so people clearly are very excited so everybody's in okay so guys next week jurassic park i'll see you then thank you very much for joining me please help me out share this video i mean it's going to go up and people can actually see it um so share the video um, on your facebook uh, tell people about the, the club, let people join, because the more people that come, the more fun it is for us to do the discussion. And uh, hopefully um, we continue doing this and uh, stay safe. I hope you guys are doing well in the quarantine. I'm losing my mind. Um, and uh, press that like button, press the share button, press the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed, and also press the bell uh, notification so that you make sure that my video shows up in your feed whenever it's out. And I'll see you guys around. Take care. And this was actually a fun discussion. On to the next movie. Bye.